Hey everyone, welcome to this week's edition of Title Scoop. So this week we're going to talk about closing instructions. This is a topic that's sometimes overlooked because it's just part of the closing, but it's really important. Uh, closing instructions really provide us some guidance, but we're also a lot of times uh, signing these instructions, so it's really, really important that we read them. For the most part, closing instructions are gonna come from your lender, but sometimes they'll come from one of the attorneys involved in the transaction, uh, and it might be the attorney for the bank. So on a commercial deal, a lot of times you may see closing instructions from uh, the attorney for the bank or even from the attorney representing one of the parties. Like I said earlier, the, the purpose of closing instructions is really to instruct the escrow agents uh, the conditions necessary to get the closing done and then any process that needs to be followed in order to finish the closing. Like I said, they do require a signature, not always, but a lot of times that's going to be required. So it's really, really important that you read them and you make sure you can do everything they're saying that you need to do. You certainly don't wanna sign off on something that you can't do because you could be creating liability for your company. So if you read through closing instructions and you're like, whoa, wait, we can't record you know, within 24 hours or whatever the requirement might be, you really need to probably take that to management uh, so that you can address whether or not you can talk to the lender about whether that can be changed. So you're going to see different formats. Um, and there is a, an organization called MISMO, and I'm gonna read what that stands for. It's Mortgage Industry Standards Maintenance Organization. And they actually do have templates. So you might see two banks uh, that have really similar templates, so they can use those. The whole point behind that organization is they were trying to create some consistency with closing instructions. But if you're a closer or an escrow officer, you will know that they come in all shapes and sizes and forms. So you really just need to read from front to back to make sure that everything that they say is going to be done. Um, the one thing I would say is a best practice, if you notice anything that you need to make sure someone knows, note it in your file so that the next person knows, uh, just so that you don't have any issues going forward on that. Because you're signing off saying you can do it, make sure that the people after you can actually do what you're saying they can do, and then if there are requirements that they're following those properly. So if you wanna see an example, um, I would honestly just ask one of your closers or escrow officers, they're going to have plenty because they probably have them on almost every transaction where there's a lender involved. Now, most closing instructions include a lot of different things. They're going to have the documents to be signed. They'll just have a list of those. They'll tell you how the person needs to sign. Um, you know, if it's a trust, they may tell you how to sign that way, if there's a middle initial, things like that. So you wanna make sure that you do have the person sign how they want them to sign. Uh, they'll tell you the title insurance and they'll usually list the endorsements. Now it's really important to read that and add those endorsement fees if there are any, because they won't always be included in the fees that they put in the closing instructions. They'll have pre-closing conditions, so make sure if there's things you need to be sending to them that you do it. Funding requirements, and we're going to talk about that in a minute because funding is really important. So they'll tell you what you need to do in order to fund your file. Um, they'll also tell you what documents need to be returned, where to return them. Same with the final title policy. Sometimes the mortgage or deed of trust is going one place and the policy is going somewhere else. So that's just something to note. They'll tell you how the lender should read. A lot of times we figure that out up front with a CPL request, but if you don't have a CPL for some reason, this will tell you exactly how it needs to read and they usually are gonna want that to match with your, with your CPL if you do issue one. If there's any changes, they usually have a section where it'll say, hey, if this happens, this is what you need to do. Um, a lot of times you'll see an assurance there's no money under the table basically, like there's no uh, change of money that's not being disclosed. Uh, that's something that you'll see sometimes copies of ID, so they may say you need one or two forms, what forms that they'll accept, hazard insurance requirements, they usually have a little section on that, and then they'll include the fees that you need to put. And with those fees, a lot of times they'll tell you if they're net funded, whether you need to collect those, or whether those are going to third parties. So all things that you can see if you, if you read through. They are usually multiple pages long, so it is a lot of reading, but again, I really encourage people to read it because you're signing off and potentially creating liability for your company, so definitely read those and ask questions. So I didn't mention funding authorization. That's a big one. That's going to tell you what documents they need, where it needs to be sent, and what you need to do in order to get approval. Now they could say they're gonna fund with a number or an email, potentially verbally. If for some reason it's verbal, I would really encourage you to send an email after they call or you talk to them and just say, just confirming we do have funding approval, just so you've got that paper trail for your file. Um, if you don't have funding approval and you fund, you're going to have issues. So again, I think everybody knows that, but if you don't and you happen to be jumping in to do a closing, make sure you're following the rules and your closing instruction letter to get funding proper. 
Uh, the last thing we'll address is just some post-closing responsibilities. So if something happens during the close or after the closing, or you notice it after the closing, uh, that could be, you know, we need to re-record or re-acknowledge. Uh, maybe they didn't sign a section. Usually the closing instructions will actually address that. So that's something you can look for in your closing instructions. If something happens after closing that's noticed and you need to address it. Uh, the other thing I guess would be TRID. Probably if there's a TRID violation, uh, usually there's a section in there of what to do and who to call. So with that, we'll call it a week. Otherwise, we'll see you next week.